the attack came as a complete surprise. While the soldiers of the Egyptian Amun division were setting up camp for their commander Ramses II, preparing to storm the city of Kadesh, a devastating attack burst upon them. Over 2,000 Hittite chariots fully armed overran the Egyptian positions without warning. Those who fought back were cut down. The soldiers ran, screaming, unable to defend themselves. Even their young pharaoh, Ramses II, later called the Great, their true god, they left to fend for himself. Ramses was not only in danger of losing the battle, but also the Egyptian Empire and his life. The famous Battle of Kadesh in 1274 BC between the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II and the Hittite king Muvatali was one of the highlights in a long series of battles and wars between Egypt and the Kingdom of Hatti over the control of Syria and Lebanon. This battle from the late Bronze Age with tens of thousands of soldiers and thousands of chariots is one of the best preserved battles in early history in terms of source material, and can be reconstructed down to the smallest tactical detail. We owe all these details Pharaoh Ramses, who immortalized himself after the battle, in poems and reliefs on the temple walls built by him as a glorious victor. A victory that Ramses had in fact never achieved. If our understanding of the battle was based only on the Egyptian sources, then we would have no doubt today that Ramses celebrated an overwhelming victory over the Hittites in 1274. But Hittite records from the ruins of the capital, ancient Hattusa, paint a different picture of history. In order to understand why the city of Kadesh was of such great importance to both warring factions, one has to look at the political development of the Eastern Mediterranean in the Late Bronze Age. Egypt had been the leading power for much of the Bronze Age. Under the rule of Pharaoh Tutmosis III, the Egyptians advanced as far as Ugarid, northern Syria and the Euphrates River, securing strategically important sites such as the fortress of Kadesh, without which the empire was extremely vulnerable to attack from the north. Tutmosis' successors had tried to more or less defend the Egyptians' fear of influence in the north, but with the accession of pharaohs Akhenaten in Egypt, the balance of power changed completely. Akhenaten preferred to establish a one-god state, the cult of Aton, which was a revolution polytheistic Egypt, rather than realpolitik. To put down revolts and opponents, Akhenaten deployed Egypt's army mainly in the interior. This led to a defection of many Syrian city-states to the new power in the region, the Hittites. The Hittites had created the Hatti Empire in the highlands of Anatolia on the peninsula of Asia Minor with their capital Hattusa. 
They had probably migrated to Anatolia around 2000 BC and their population consisted mostly of free farmers and merchants. From the 16th to the 13th century BC, the Hittites subjugated large parts of Asia Minor from the Anatolian heartland and after the destruction of the Mitanni Empire rose to become a great power themselves. Nevertheless, the Hittites were initially anxious to avoid war with the Egyptians, but they took advantage of the weakness of the 18th dynasty and began conquering Egyptian territories, thus becoming a direct enemy of the Egyptians. The strategic bone of contention between the two powers for supremacy in Syria has always been a city, Kadesh. Only Ramses II's grandfather, General, turned the tide. As the founder of the 19th dynasty, rising from the rank of general and not of royal blood, he became the progenitor of a family of hardline soldiers. The new ruling family came from the Eastern Nile Delta and particularly worshipped the god Seth, the lord of chaos and violence. The man drilled his own son so much that the boy later reported that at the sight of blood, his heart beats faster. Raised accordingly hard, also the grandson, the small Ramses II, inclined early to the military. Pharaoh Setos had led several wars to reconquer Egyptian possessions in Palestine. However, when he died, at about the same time as the Hittite king Moor Seles, the question of supremacy in the Near East was still unresolved. It was the task of Ramses II to finally settle relations with the Hittite Empire. Barely on the throne, almost at the same time as the new king of the Hittites Muvatali, the young king Ramses rearmed his goal an offensive Middle Eastern policy, not only securing the existing, but expansion of his empire. Although Ramses needed no pretext for war with the Hittites in Syria, the pharaoh received one when the king of Amaru changed sides and defected to Egypt. In the fourth year of his reign in 1275, therefore, the 29-year-old Ramses led the first military expedition into Syria, which took him as far as Amaru on the Hittite frontier, where the king of Amaru formally gave him his oath of allegiance. There was no direct confrontation with the Hittites, but Ramses knew that it was only a matter of time for that to happen. The pharaoh then led his army back to Egypt. The new capital, P. Ramses, located in the Nile Delta, served as an advanced base of operations in the young pharaoh's military plans. Thousands of soldiers were stationed in the city, there were barracks, parade grounds, extensive training tracks for the war horses, and a harbor for the war fleet. The great armorers of the empire were also located there. The archaeologists found huge furnaces and 15-meter-long smelting batteries. Arrowheads and spearheads were manufactured at high speed, as were swords, lances and horseshoes. While Ramses was transforming the Egyptian army, his Hittite rival did not remain idle. King Muwatali II had also fundamentally changed his empire, for example by moving the capital of the empire from Atusa in the north to the newly founded city of Tarun Tassa in the south. In addition to shifting the center of the empire, the Hittite king also reorganized the vassal states in the west and north of the empire. In this way, Muvatali increased the troop strength at his disposal considerably. And it was not long before King Muvatali learned that Amaru had defected, which not only posed a great danger to the city of Kadesh, but also posed a serious threat to the vital Syrian cities of Aleppo and Kachemish, which did not have enough troops to withstand the full might of Egypt. Therefore, during the winter and into the spring of 1274 BC, the Hittite ruler gathered troops from all parts of this empire. Besides the native allied and vassal troops, 
Muvatali also spent a lot of silver to recruit a considerable number of mercenaries, so that he managed to raise a huge army of about 37,000 infantry, 10,000 charioteers and 3,500 chariots. Ramses, meanwhile, assembled four divisions of the Egyptian field army. The first unit was the Amun division, which was composed of men recruited in the city of Thebes. Ramses personally led the Amun division, which traveled with him and his royal entourage in the vanguard. The second unit was Re, with soldiers from the city of Helipolis. The third division was Seth, whose troops came mostly from the pharaoh's new military base at P. Ramesses and from the rest of the northeastern Nile Delta region. The fourth division was Pa, recruited from Memphis and the surrounding area. The Egyptian army included about 16,000 infantrymen, 4,000 charioteers and 2,000 chariots. Egyptian Kadesh sources spoke of an orderly departure in the fifth year on the ninth day of the second summer month. The army covered about 15 to 20 kilometers per day. The vanguard was formed by scouts. Then the king followed in his chariot, protected by his bodyguard. Behind them the bulk of the chariots, two-wheeled wagons manned by a fighter and a driver each, and then followed the foot troops. During the advance, the weapons were carried in a supply train. In the sweltering heat, it was easier to walk without a javelin, arrows, bow, axe, shield and a scimitar. The nights were spent in tent camps, which were protected by a wall of shields. In the plain of Sharon, a kind of elite intervention force, the Naruna, separated from the army. It was to advance along the coast to the mouth of the Orlotras, and then from the west towards Kadesh, while Ramses marched there with the army on a direct route. The route of the advance leads the Egyptians from the capital in the eastern delta along the coast via Gaza, first to the Ramses city in the valley of Furs, the capital of the Egyptian province of Upe. Exactly 30 days after his departure, the king finally reaches Arunama, located in the hill country of Kadesh. From a hill, Ramses could already see the lights of the fortress, 25 kilometers away. Not far from the Egyptian camp, the guards picked up two Bedouin leaders who pretended to be defectors to the pharaoh. The prisoners told the pharaoh that Muvatali was hiding out of fear, some 150 kilometers north of Kadesh near Aleppo, with his army and did not venture further south. The fortress of Kadesh itself was defended only by local troops. The idea of a fear-stricken Muvatali pleased Ramses so much that he believed the Bedouins. What an opportunity! Kadesh lay before him unprotected, like a ripe fruit that only he had to pick. Ramses was so blinded by his confidence in victory that he gave up all caution and ordered the assault on Kadesh. Together with his staff, his bodyguard and the Amun division, he crossed the Orentis River the next day without waiting for the other divisions of his army to catch up, all of which were several kilometers behind. They advanced into the plain of Kadesh, where they halted northwest of the fortress, and carelessly began to set up a camp to serve as a launching pad for the attack. Construction crews formed a square with high shields and erected the pharaoh's spacious tent with a bedroom, workplace and an audience hall. More modest tents were reserved for the officers, and most of their troops slept under the open sky. Even the pharaoh's golden throne was brought for his comfort. 
The next morning was hazy, and the fortress of Kadesh was only gradually emerging from the fog. Its impressive size was a challenge even for the Egyptian army. Protected by the Orantes and a side branch, an artificial canal, and at the same time beforested hills, it seemed indeed impregnable. From the hilltop where Ramses and the Amun division had taken position, Ray's division could be seen on the plain, preparing to cross the plain to the fortress. The Ptah division was marching between the forest and the Orantes ford, and the Seth unit would soon follow. Two Hittites were suddenly brought before the pharaoh. Torture had obviously made them talk. They pretended to be scouts sent by King Muvatali to reconnoiter the location of Ramses. Where is the wretch of Hati? Ramses wanted to know. I heard he is hiding near Aleppo. The answer of the frightened spies hit the otherwise self-confident pharaoh like a thunderclap. Our king's army has joined forces with many foreign lands and it is equipped with infantry, chariots and armor of war and their number are greater than the sands on the river bank. They stand armed and ready for battle behind the ancient city of Kadesh. The pharaoh's vast army was spread out more than 50 kilometers and the enemy was very close and ready to strike. Ramses had led his troops into a trap. He hurriedly sent out messengers to alert the raid division to come to his aid. Hoping for the other two units, Pa and Seth was almost hopeless because of the great distances. While Ramses was holding a council of war, clouds of dust rose from the sky behind the hills around Kadesh. 2,500 Hittite chariots broke out of the forests, crossing the Orentes on several prepared underwater footbridges. The sturdy chariots, each manned by three soldiers, slammed into the open flank of the Ray Division, which was marching unsuspectedly along the river bank, unprepared for battle. The soldiers of the Ray Division had no chance. They were cut down by the hundreds. Those who managed to escape could count themselves lucky. In panic, the survivors tried to make their way to the pharaoh's camp. The victorious Hittite chariots close on their heels. The pharaoh had no time to form the Amun division into a fighting unit. He was just able to put on his armor, harness his horses and mount his chariot. And the Hittites, coming from the south, driving before them the soldiers of the Ray division, including two sons of Ramses who had gone campaigning with their father, invaded the camp. The allied princes applauded Muvatali, the king of Hati, who, with his entourage, watched the confrontation outside the walls of the fortress. The ruler's ingenious plan proved to be exceedingly effective. The army of the arrogant Ramses was in disintegration, and the Egyptian soldiers ran away like startled hares. Now the pharaoh did something that could only be described as suicidal. He ordered his charioteer to take the reins and, shouting loudly, Ramses dashed into the middle of the army of the Hittites. Ramses, the reckless warrior, drew arrow after arrow from his quiver on the chariot and shot down one Hittite after another with dreamlike certainty. It was not just any general fought here. It was Ramses the Great, the fortunate one, the son of a moon, for whom the gods performed a miracle. Ramses brought down the enemy teams one by one, but each fallen Hittite was replaced by another, coming from somewhere. Ramses looked around, discovered that there were far fewer fighters at his side than he had expected, a few officers and the soldiers of his bodyguard, barely more than a hundred men. Where were they, his brave legions? He was almost alone, like a shark. The realization hit him. His troops had abandoned him, him, the pharaoh. But luck was with the brave Ramses. Many Hittite fighters did not press on their attack. Since they were not normally paid, they took the first opportunity to plunder the royal Egyptian camp. 
And it was no less than a miracle what happened now. His elite force, the Naruna, which had separated days ago from the main body of the army, suddenly appeared on the battlefield, coming from the coastal road in the west, and invaded the ranks of the Hittites. Although this unit could not reverse the course of the battle, it managed to rescue Ramses unharmed from the hopeless situation. With the intervention of this elite unit, which neither Ramses nor Muvatali had expected at this moment, the strategic situation changed completely. Ramses, whose defeat had just been a matter of time, now finds himself pushed from the defensive to the offensive. The Patar division was at this moment still four kilometers away from the battlefield and would be available in an hour. The Sheikh Muvatali tried to regain the initiative and forced a decision before the arrival of the Pa division. He threw his last thousand chariots into the battle, his elite force. Mina, the charioteer of Ramses, was the first to notice that a new army of thousand chariots was crossing the Orentes. Ramses ordered his charioteer to turn the chariot around and took off again, racing at the enemy ranks, trying to prevent them from crossing the river. Six times Ramses made his chariot turn, six times he dashed forward again into the Hittite phalanx. Now Muvatali's army found itself in the same situation as that of the Egyptians before. It was surrounded on two sides. The Pa division was advancing from the south, while Ramses, his bodyguard and the elite Naruna unit were fighting in the north. As dusk fell over the Orentes Valley, the Hittites had no choice. They had to retreat with their chariots over the Orentes, where the army of foot soldiers, which had not yet come into action, could protect them. In many places, however, the Hittite retreat must have turned into a flight, and the sight of the Hittite forces must not have inspired much confidence, for Muvatali preferred to retreat with his followers into the safety of the fortress. And so that day ended in a draw before Kadesh, for neither Ramses nor Muvatali had gained a meter of ground. Kadesh remained in Hittite hands, and the plain in front of the fortress was littered with numerous dead from both sides. The Egyptians marched over the corpses of the Hittites and cut off a hand of each. No one dared approach the pharaoh. Ramses, covered in blood, got down from his golden chariot and patted his two horses. He didn't look at the soldiers who were anxiously waiting. He expressed contempt for the performance of his army that day and told the soldiers that when they returned home he would dismiss cowards from the army and make their family breadless. The Egyptians hardly slept that night because they still had to set up camp in front of the fortress and a new order of battle was ordered for tomorrow. The chronicles say Ramses was ready for battle like a mighty bull. His anger at being duped with a simple ruse was great. As the first rays of the sun shone behind the mountains, an unarmed Hittite detachment crossed the river, went to the camp of the Amun division, and presented the pharaoh with a message from Muvatali. Without a word, Ramses gave the tablet to the scribe to read. The Hittite king offered Ramses a truce. Ramses then summoned his advisors and generals, showed them the letter and asked what to do next. The divisions Amun and Re had suffered heavy losses. Only Pa and Seth were fully operational. With two army divisions worn out, neither battle nor war could be won, the less so as 37,000 rested Hittite foot soldiers were waiting on the other bank of the Orentes. Eventually the pharaoh decided to retreat. On the same day, he began the return march with his army to his capital in the Nile Delta. The 
Battle of Kadesh had remained without a real victory. But, although the Egyptian army had only narrowly escaped a catastrophe, Ramses allowed himself to be celebrated as a brilliant victor on many monuments in Egypt. He described Muvatali as an opponent who, humiliated, had begged for peace. After the Battle of Kadesh, the Egyptians and Hittites continued to wage small-scale warfare in Syria for many years. Eventually, however, both powers realized that they were not able to defeat the other. On the initiative of the new Hittite king Mursuli III, a peace treaty was signed in Babylonian, the diplomatic language of the time. Hittite and Egyptian jurists had collaborated on the final version. Each side received a silver tablet with the text of the treaty. Copies of the text still exist in hieroglyphic and cuneiform script. <laughs> 